All right. Well, hello, Yako. It's very nice to see you too. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Thank here you very with much. Yako Funsale, mm -hmm. and I had the great pleasure of speaking with you recently for the CTA podcast, and it was really nice to get to know you a little bit during that process. But I am, um, I have, I, I don't know a lot about how you've entered this this storyline that we're all in right now. And I'd love to hear more about that. And um, you're involved in CTA and you're one of the two hosts of the CTA podcast with Christine Stephen. And yes. that is a wonderful project. I really encourage people to check that out if they haven't seen it yet, because these conversations are so meaningful and, and, and valuable that you, you guys are having over there. But would you yeah. sort of introduce yourself and, and give a little bit of your background? Yes, so like I said, my name is Jaco van Sel, um, as you can judge by the name and the accent that um, I'm originally from South Africa. Um, my husband and I moved to Ireland in January last year, 2022. Um, I have been a psychologist since training, say for, for eight years now. Before I was a psychologist, I worked in environmental management. I was an environmental consultant and also in metals and mining industry. My first qualification was a bachelor's in, of science in chemistry and microbiology. Um, and I later, in my later 20s, I started, I decided to, um, to, to, to formalize my knowledge of psychology. I'd always been reading psychology. Maybe I should just go a bit back into my own background. So we, so I grew up in South Africa around the eighties, was the, during the dying throngs of apartheid. I mean, it was a difficult time. It was a confusing time, uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty. It was also a time in our lives, in our family's lives, where there was trouble. I would say that I came. I'm, I'm from a from a family with. Um, I wouldn't say intergener intergenerational trouble, but we inherit some stuff from previous generations. My father's an alcoholic, so th those th those were the circumstances under which I grew up in. In my secondary school years, we decided to become Jehovah's Witnesses. And we can go into the psychology of that cult mindset and why it was necessary for us to retreat into a cult mindset. In my 20s, I exited. But throughout the time I had been reading psychology to try and understand the psychology behind addiction, the psychology behind people joining certain high control religions, and that is when I exited. So that is when I also decided toward the end of my 20s to enter or to, to formalize my, my knowledge of psychology. And I started studying um, a bachelor's of arts in psychology and linguistics and later a master's in clinical psychology in my early 30s. So I think understanding what we're going to discuss, we need to understand the psychic retreats, the strategies people sometimes employ, the appeal to seek quick answers, easy answers to complex questions, and then the inevitable encounter with reality when reality catches up with fantasy. So that is just a, a, a brief introduction to my background. The way I got involved with the CTA was, I think it was still back in South Africa, when I read an article by Val Thomas. Mm -hmm. It was the article that appeared on the New Discourses website of James Lindsay. Um, and I really battled to get hold of Val Thomas because I wanted to know what was what was the organization, was, was she affiliated? I really wanted to um, make contact with her because I, I really shared some of the sentiments. Um, but it was, like I said, it was difficult to get hold of her. Um, but one day someone posted something of the critical therapy antidote on a Facebook page. And that was through that post that I got into contact with Val. And I subsequently joined the CTA. And it was last year somewhere when, even after moving to, to Ireland, when Val decided maybe we should build, we should take the CTA to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that is where we're at currently. Yeah. It sounds like your own background really led you to be very curious about why people do mm -hmm. what they do. 
And I, mm. uh, I thought it was interesting. You used a phrase that I wasn't, that I'm not familiar with high control religion. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about that. How is that different from a cult and how is that similar to a cult? What is, could you elaborate on that a little bit? So high control religion is what I would say a more neutral way of describing certain religions when the the the, the relig religion in itself does not necessarily re re resemble a cult as clearly. Okay. So with cults, we usually have a religion in mind where there would be a prominent leader, and that prominent leader would would would, would act as the mouthpiece of God or a prophet from God. And there would be very strict rules. Um, but many times these, these religions might be congregations affiliated with a broader religion, mm -hmm. such as the Protestant group of religions, or it might even be a non-theistic religion. Um, there, are certain, there, there, are, there are certain political religions even. And to, to call certain, certain groupings a Cult might feel too far fetched, might feel a bit, you know, st you know, stretching it a bit. And the word cult typically has um, a derogatory association with the term. So, high control religion is, in my opinion, a much more appropriate description of what is actually going on. There is a, there is a, a strict, a severe imposition of religious tenets, policing, thought control um con uh, conscience control um, um lack of uh, personal freedom prohibition of engaging in certain behaviors prohibition of engaging with certain associations um and then also the certain bribes the bribe of you know, the, the 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 threat of hell or threat of armageddon or the threat of destruction or the threat threat of um, um invasion by the enemy and also the bribe, the the the, the appeal of some reward, mm. post mortal reward, um, inheriting paradise, freedom, you know, finally emancipated, that type mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. And when you say that there are political religions, mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm thinking we're talking about critical social justice theory here, but what are you? What do you have in mind? Am, am I right in thinking that that's an interpretation of what we're experiencing right now? Yeah, so I think we something we, we can also can think of is a related word in terms of this, uh, de de describing certain certain trends and certain groupings around a personality it would be what, what we would call also personality cults. And this is where I control political religions come in. But you might have a very charismatic leader, many promises, a leader that really speaks to the heart of its followers or, or their followers, um, a leader that's very well attuned with the followers, their wounds, their history, their resentments, their desires. I think in our um, interview, I said, groups have very limited reality contact. Groups... Mm -hmm tend to go into the imaginary. And in the imaginary, there are just three emotions that exist. Fear, anger or aggression, and desire. Mm. And that's it. A personality cult or a political religion or a high control religion um, is usually led by a person that's very well attuned to the desires, the fears, and the, and, and the, and the anger, the aggression of its of its members mm -hmm. and when they play into those fantasies they can really rile up the crowd it's almost as if mass formation type of group illusion even delusion is established and in the frenzy the political leader gets the group to commit things or to get themselves involved in things that that the members as individuals would otherwise not have gotten themselves involved with. And how, how do we explain what's happening now in terms of high control religion or cult with, in the absence of a charismatic leader or a set of charismatic leaders? How, how is it alike and how is it different from, yeah. from those other organizations? 
Those are good questions. I think what we do see is we don't see a single leader. There's no pope. There's no prophet mm -hmm. within the critical social justice movement. But there are thinkers. There are prophets, past prophets. There are martyrs. Um, Gramsci would be a martyr. I'm talking Gramsci. Um, uh, there would be there would be other historical figures such as um, Eric Marcuse, um, Foucault. So these would be the the, the prophets of the critical of the critical social justice. So asked me about how do we how do we see the critical social justice movement? Is it a type of a political? political setup. It is most certainly political. They also have their mouthpieces today. There are political leaders, certainly certain um, presidents that, that, that have endorsed critical social justice ideas. It is being preached um, at universities. I think one of the major similarities with religion uh, that critical social justice has would be that it is a totalizing worldview. It tends and it claims to explain everything. Mm -hmm. It's a very simplistic worldview, as with some other mainstream religions. There is also the split between all good and all bad. Mm -hmm. That that if you endorse critical con critical consciousness, that you are within the bigger fold of the selected religion. If you do not, you are either a heretic or you're an apostate. If you used to be of the fold and you started criticizing it. And this is sacred knowledge. This cannot be wrong. This cannot be false. Mm -hmm. There is also a threat attached to it. If there is any leniency shown or any, um, any generosity shown towards any other competing worldview, you're starting to side with the enemy. Mm -hmm. You're starting to approve of the oppression. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're not appreciating the imminent threat that that the that that you as a victim cult or as a victim group are actually um, experiencing and then you need to get re-educated you need to go for training you are threatened with cancellation and in the social setting cancellation is like dying mm -hmm. it is social death um, it is not only cancellation in terms of losing membership or losing companionship with people you used to associate with there's also severe humiliation mm -hmm. involved in it um physical attacks too you cannot rule that out mm -hmm. in in terms of re religion there are also certain holy days we have no the holy month of pride oh pride instance. yeah um by the way, I am I'm gay, but I yeah, the Pride Month uh, to critical social justice, in spite of my sexual orientation. I do not like the idea that someone's sexual orientation needs to be an identity. I think there's mm -hmm. way more to a person than who they fall in love with or who they feel sexually attracted to. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting also then to see how they have captured certain trains around them to support their political agendas. So in the past, homosexuality would have been conceptualized as behavior. It would later be, oh, it would, in, 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 within the Christian world, it would be conceptualized as sinful behavior. Mm -hmm. Later in the 19th century, it was classified as an orientation. Mm -hmm. In the 20th century, it moved, it got reified, it got, it, 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 um, assumed an existence of not only an orientation, but an identity. Mm -hmm. And later, this identity was politicized among so many other identity, types of identities. And this is one of many identities that are grouped under a victimhood identity. We find ourselves gl globally in the West within um, a victimhood culture, and for victims to exist, it's got to be a villain. It's got mm -hmm. to be an oppressor, an evil other. Mm -hmm. And the evil other would be the historical, traditional, white male. 
the, um, the, the, the Western mindset, the West way of thinking about things. Um, there are also symbols, the flag, the fist. There are certain chants, very shortened chants that they employ. And these are all hallmarks of a type of a, of a religious movement, a political religious movement. Um, and because it is a movement that 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 really looks into the nitty gritty of what people say and what people do, it is a high control religion. Mm. It is intolerant of anything but what that religion prescribes as true. And what prevails is not necessarily objective truth, because objective truth is part of the enemy's epistemology and ontology. Um, what they what what they focus on would be subjective truth. Mm -hmm. If it's subjective, well, it can't really be, be called truth, can it? So it's more subjective experience, subjective perception that is forwarded as as true. Yeah, the the way that you describe this as totalizing and as um, what was the phrase or word you used? I would say black and white, but it's all, yeah. all or nothing. It's sort of, it is, it's yeah. good and evil. It's the splitting of your, this is true. This just, we own the truth that um, I, I think that those things were so, they, they presented really obvious red flags for me when I was encountering this to be when I first started encountering it, especially when I was in, in graduate school. And um, how, how do you make sense of the fact that this has taken such a hold in psychology? This is the thing that, that puzzles me because these are people that you would think would have been primed to see this coming and be aware of it and know how to mitigate for this. And yet it's, being pushed through the schools of psychology and and it 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 subverts everything that we learned prior to the implementation of this social justice ideology yeah. it 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 stands in opposition to the training that psychologists and psychology students will have had over the years why is this taking hold there and how is how do you make sense of that yeah those are good questions. The impression that I get is um, is as follows. Um, I think I think it has something to do with the the history of psychology, where very early on the Frankfurt School started to to use psychoanalysis as a way to understand society, and they weaponized psychoanalysis. Um, in their critique of society and they imposed some of their newly form formulated ideas political ideas with their psychoanalytic understanding in mind so i think there there there's there, there is something in the history of particularly psychoanalysis and uh, marxism because along the psychoanalytic history marxism was this the, the 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 source of this this collusion between psychoanalysis and what we currently have critical social justice and i think also because psychology is part of the humanities um it, obviously they they integrated jacques foucault which is then, then from a different historical stream of postmodernism where it is questioned as to whether what you believe is what you believe as truth, whether it is actually true, or um, just to question how much of your own stuff do you read into interpreting what you claim to be objective truth, and that is okay because one can use that to more stringently look at what we try to measure, like you know what we call a convergence of measurements. In other words, different methods of trying to uh, to, to, to determine what is true, so as to so as to determine how accurately our conclusion reflects reality. Mm. But that starts being infiltrated, and 
I think uh, Foucault's idea of biopower, namely the suspicion that we tend to believe what is imposed upon us by institutions that are inevitably very, very powerful or ostensibly very, very powerful, um, that we tend to be biased in what we consider to be true. Mm -hmm. And that is where the suspicion came in. Mm -hmm. But with the suspicion, also the rhetoric, the, um, the, 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 the discourse of victimhood, there we have, again, the Marxists to blame, because the Marxists moved from a class-based resentment, a class-based inequality, to an identity-based resentment and identity-based identity -based inequality, to look through the lens of identity and to determine without question that certain identities will be threatened, others will be privileged, and to have that mindset, that, that, that it is a paranoid mindset in mind, and to judge everything that happens around you through that lens. And that is how it got infiltrated into humanities. It got brought over into psychology. And that be initially, it was a way, it was a worldview, mm -hmm. one of many through which we can look at reality. Because this worldview does not tolerate any, anything else, Conflicts started to exist between between worldviews that stand for things that this other worldview clearly condemns, and through this one worldview of so-called compassion, the the, the 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 train moved into the direction where they had to decide: Are we going to tolerate these competing worldviews, knowing that they cause harm? And that is how incrementally tolerance of competing worldviews got reduced and this one worldview started taking over the psychological field it also that... came with multi it also came with multiculturalism mm -hmm. okay where certain certain um, other ways of thinking need to be incorporated into into the psychological field and i'm okay with it mm -hmm. i'm really okay with sitting with someone in in therapy having adequate knowledge of say islam or or, or Hinduism, or whatever the case may be, and 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 using the concepts, using their way of thinking, and eliciting certain internal conflicts they might have psychologically, um, getting them to process what's still left unprocessed. I'm really just fine with it. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that got in, that 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 um, actually sabotage the psychological field would be the discourse of resentment. Mm -hmm. Many activists came into psychology too, and they had this discourse of resentment. Mm -hmm. And it is within this discourse that we are being taught psychology now, and that we resent certain identities. We resent our society as a whole because it is largely oppressive. Mm -hmm. um, and it is within this discourse that psychology currently exists. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that, for mm. that deep dive there, because I think that helps to frame things in a way that makes sense of the, the takeover that yeah. we've experienced. And, it, you know, I, I think that you said something about weaponizing psychoanalytic theory as a means of understanding society and then reshaping individuals. I think that's really, really um it's really fascinating, and I'd love to hear more about that. And and I, I but I kind of come back to my, as a student, an undergrad student of psychology and social psychology, prior to this stuff really taking the place that it's taking in our programs right now. I mm. feel like I was taught the very things that I needed to know to understand what I was seeing when I started seeing this happen, and so it's the individual professors and the people leading these programs, maybe this is kind of getting into the weeds and being a, a, a little stubborn about trying to understand this, but I really, I don't understand how these people could make a shift from teaching you the very tools that you needed to understand these logical inconsistencies and these emotional um traps that that we've fallen into as we've moved into these discourses of resentment as you call them which i think is a really great mm -hmm. phrase and yeah 
you know, it just seems like it's going to be a, probably a different story for every individual, because at the end of the day, we all are individuals coping with this in our own way, but there are overarching patterns that I, I, I'm struggling to understand how people have allowed themselves to go from critical thinkers who understand these, these group dynamics mm. to agents of something like this, this yeah. high control religion. Well, we can actually, how about you and I think together about this? It has been quite a few decades since the West found itself um, embroiled in an internal war. Mm. Quite a few, right? It was the Iraq war around 2000, but it's far away. 9-11 mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. I get that. That was, a, that, was, that was quite a severe trauma to the West. Mm -hmm. I get that. But by and large, the West has been peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, There has been um, so so th so there's been a growth in comfort in the West. Mm -hmm. It inevitably it, in, it inevitably created um, a society in which suffering was no longer su something that, that revolved around issues of survival. Okay, suffering started to to revolve around issues of again issues of comfort, mm -hmm. emotional suffering, imagined suffering. And you can see this incremental movement where, where things like aggression is not it's, it's not sufficient to speak about aggression anymore. We need to 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 to, to think around microaggressions. Mm -hmm. I think it, there was also this discourse around compassion, how to care more and more and more. Many people were uplifted ab out of out of poverty. And I think eventually you run out of things to 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 worry about, and you mm. need to create things to fuss about. Mm. And I think that is part of the picture. Mm -hmm. A lot of rich families. Um, Jonathan Haidt and 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 Greg Lukiano speaks speak of the coddling of the American mind. During the eighties, there were um, a bout of kidnappings in the in in the, in the U.S. So helicopter parenting started to take place where children were no longer permitted to, to explore the world more freely without mommy or daddy intervening preemptively. Mm -hmm. That needs to be think needs to be thought about too. Um sorry, I just I just scribbled a few things. Um we need to think about social so social media too, mm -hmm. um, where appearances is everything. The entertainment industry. Just this morning, I told someone that programs like Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent, Idols, etc., they really push this idea that someone with talent isn't enough. It's got to be someone with talent and a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So that is what we call the commodification of suffering. In other words, people get rewarded for suffering. There are other two authors, um, Campbell and Manning. They have written a lot on microaggressions where they, they show that our society has moved from a dignity society to a victimhood society. Oh, a dignity and society to a victimhood society. To a victimhood okay. society. Okay. In certain society, we've got honor societies, we've got, vic we've got dignity societies, but we've got uh, um, victimhood societies. So an honor society it would be something where the inherent value, the inherent dignity of a person isn't assumed. Your honor needs to be defended. It is often defended through aggression. That's an honor okay. society. Certain, okay. like like in 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 Asia and Africa, there are honor societies. A dignity, a dignity society is a society in which inherent dignity is assumed. Um, there are certain institutions that will protect your dignity should you be threatened in, in you know violently um and through and, and, and should the, the the insult to your dignity be so severe that that that, that, that 
couldn't defend yourself. So there are institutions to help you also protect your dignity. With victimhood, it is a mixture of the two. So where just people... real quick, going back mm -hmm. to the dignity, because the, there's a little bit of a disturbance on the line and there was a brief cutting. I don't know if that'll come through in the recording, but I just want to clarify. Right. So you say in a dignity society, mm -hmm. there's there are institutions that will protect, that dignity is assumed and institutions will protect your dignity. What do you mean by that? So suppose there is a severe crime in Julia, severe... Uh, um, insult to a person's dignity in the form of vicious gossip. Okay. Instead of attacking the perpetrator, which would be the case in an honest society, we don't resort to violence that way. There are institutions through which we work mm. that could remedy this so that the dignity of, of, of all people could be protected. So like the legal system. A legal system. Okay. Um, in a victimhood society, people do resort to violence. Mm. Violence is justified. Language is to be policed. Small slights um, is, you know, are considered to be microaggressions, and that would be a justification for retaliatory attack. And then they would also not just use institutions to remedy the situation, they rile up institutions to fight the fight of these victims. So it is within this resentment narrative that we, 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 we that, that victim um, societies exist. So and victimhood that is where society is a combination of the honor society right. and, the, and the dignity society. Okay, this, so- it is, a, it, is a, it, is a, it is a combination of elements of the honor society, namely that if a person were to be insulted, that person would have to defend their honor. That is what the what the victims also do. In a dignity society, you, we, we have this, this saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, mm -hmm. but w words won't hurt me or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so many times we, we brush off certain verbal insults mm -hmm. as, as insignificant because we of our internal dignity mm -hmm. that is not assumed in a victim of society and that is why they tend to use institutions so viciously and so aggressively to fight against even minor um, slights mm -hmm. so that's the victim of society um, so I think I think I think that also needs to be in, in, incorporated into our assessment as to what went wrong mm -hmm. It was also the disappearance of religion. Gradual disappearance of religion. Religion serves as a map. Um, meaning making takes place through the eyes of religion, not just uh, meaning making of your own existence, meaning making of the purpose of your, of your, of your purpose on earth. Um, and it is interesting that I recently watched the, 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 the video affirmation generation. It, it's on, on, transitioning children and toward the end Lisa Marciano says we see that our society is suffering from a disease of soul and that is the condition of, of, of the sense of meaninglessness in the past you would have um, a trade a family trade and that gave you a lot of meaning mm -hmm. um, many of the things we uh, our, our forefathers wrestled with were close were, were, were much closer to survival issues as the, uh, compared to how they are these days mm -hmm. now these days we do not have these crucial issues around which we can build meaning we do not have religion featuring as strongly around which we can create meaning so people exist in in a, in, a, in, a, in a void without meaning and then they tend to resort to activism as a means to fill that void mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I think there was also a shift now recently from we 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 used to, we used to think um, in psychology we used to think in terms of the biopsychosocial model mm -hmm. in psycho psychoanalysis certainly mm -hmm. we focused on the individual but there was a major shift to start focusing on the social mm -hmm. where they started looking at what might be wrong socially as part of the reason for individual ailments. And I think with all that we've already mentioned, 
the victim society, the discourse of resentment, um, certain in uh, certain identities that got politicized, the lack of meaning, the disappearance of religion. Um, this all, and then also certain 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 events around the world, the election of Donald Trump, maybe, and also the death of George Floyd. Mm-hmm. Floyd. These are these the, these were interpreted as assaults on minorities, mm-hmm. and I think these were all all um, um, uh, punctuations in the larger march up to where we find ourselves currently, where everything is social justice. Everything is interpreted through a woke worldview. Media too. Media thrives on this. Media wants conflict. They want controversy. It's not so media says, yes, but we want peace, we want harmony, they lie. It's not true. Mainstream media wants controversy. Think about it. If there were no controversy, it would be game over for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even within the woke worldview there is no end in sight there is only perpetual dismantling problematizing destroying mm-hmm. um, in terms of queer theory queer theory is an identity without an essence in other words <clears throat> whatever gets normalized that needs to be transgressed that needs to be defiantly destroyed and dismantled um um, I mentioned something around queer theory, and I got a thought. Well, we will come back now. Um, so this coddling, um, the sensitivity around 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 words. Um, I think also in terms of this heroism that we see among people that they just they they, they might find themselves among the oppressor group in terms of of, of of group identity, and they want to be saviors of the minorities. So they're really committed to fight their cause for them. Mm-hmm. This is all a confluence mm-hmm. into what we have today. Mm-hmm. And it is, that is what I wanted to say, mm-hmm. the perpetual dismantling of things. There is no end, there, there, is, there is no end point in sight. The other day, my husband and I chatted about certain things and he asked me, so can I say that certain ideologies um, are purely based on psychological operations. And I said, yes. Because what we describe here is, I'm going to give you the formulation, I'm going to give you the one word or the, the, the phrase that captures this, this formulation. In critical social justice, we have the following. Those who deem themselves uh, as the victim class, look at the oppressor class and they see privilege. They desire that privilege. Instead of learning from the oppressor class, instead of empowering themselves, instead of cooperating with that, with that class, instead of building resources, internal resources and capabilities to also be beneficiaries, to also be privileged, they instead resort to destruction of what they have. They want to destroy that just so that they don't feel their own lack. What I just described to you is primitive envy. With Mm. primitive envy, I desire something. I see the other possessing the thing I desire. Instead of engaging with reality so that I could eventually um, gather up resources, uh, build my capabilities to also get what the other person has, what, the, what what I desire from the other person, I instead resort to destroying what the other person has, mm-hmm. just so neither of us have it. And that is the psychological operation upon which crit- critical social justice is built. It is a, a philosophically sophistication of destructive, primitive envy. Primitive envy. I've never heard yeah. that phrase before, and I really... I really like that a lot. It does. It it's feels a like phrase. a good description. It's it's what now? Klein and phrase. Melanie Klein, the British psychoanalyst. Melanie um, Klein. She just she she goes into quite some depth. Melanie Klein mm-hmm. um, of critical of of, of um, 
pathological envy, primitive pathological envy. <clears throat> you know, I think it's 1957 paper on envy and gratitude. Okay. Wow, that really is, it's a really great um, description and simple. It simplifies the whole thing. And it makes yeah. so much sense in terms of what you're talking about. The the thing with the the privilege argument, you know, when you talk about racial privilege, is that if you follow it to its logical conclusion, you would end up reversing the roles of the privileged and the oppressed. And what would then be necessary to do under this ideology just to re, just to complete the cycle again, just continually yeah. oppressing somebody or oppressing somebody out of their privilege into marginalization and creating new privilege classes and, and, and wash, rinse, repeat. It just, it feels like it doesn't have a, um, there's not a an underpinning that that makes any sense. It's just perpetual conflict. As it's not so simple mm. for us to determine that those who were once privileged uh, would would eventually be victims. We would have to respect objective measurement. Okay. People people of the critical social justice mindset do not respect objective measurement. Objective me measurement is something hated. Mm -hmm. is, is something invented by old dead white Europeans. That is that is what what they call them. Remember, this thing is 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 perceptual. It's according to their perspective, their perceptions as to whether the other person is still privileged or not. Um, and percep uh, perceptions can be manipulated. You know, mm -hmm. there's an old piece of research by a guy by 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 two two guys called um Kleck, the, the, the um Robert Kleck and the other person Strainter is the other person's surname Roberto Strainter I think okay no Robert Kleck and someone Strainter I can't remember the, the first name and what they did was they made with with their particip with their participants they wanted to to determine whether their participants could pick up um, as to whether they were discriminated against based on physical imperfections. Okay. So they cosmetically constructed some deformity and they sent some of the participants into an interview. And based on how they experienced the interview, they then asked the participants whether they felt they were discriminated against or not based on this deformity. Okay. Interesting. It was a trick. If half of the participants, what they, what they did was they removed the deformity without the participants knowing. They just said, let me just make, make a few adjustments. And with oh. the adjustments, they removed the deformity. Okay. And they sent them in without realizing that there wasn't deformity. And when they assessed those participants again, some of them said, yes, there was discrimination based on my deformity. Mm -hmm. So this is this this is this perceptual bias, and mm -hmm. that is why the critical social justice people focus so much on personal experience, mm -hmm. because personal experience can be manipulated, and they can continue to want to dismantle, dismantle, dismantle to their heart's delight. It is destructive. From he was at the Frankfurt School. He didn't know that we would use some of these material to actually criticize this current trend in wokeism, he speaks of a necrophilic attitude. Now, we think of necrophilic in terms of the, uh, the, se the sexually dealing behavior. Mm -hmm. But he compared biophilic mindsets, those who love life with gratitude, who are creative, who want to build and cooperate and solve problems on the one hand, for those who are necrophilic, those who are aggressive, destructive, resentful, envious, Problematize, problematize on my word. And if we if we if we think in terms of perceptions, if we think that that these people will continue to want to just destroy, destroy, destroy without really producing anything new, um, if we think that they would want to do that regardless of any objective measurement as to what they're doing is actually destructive or not, you realize that they only have one thing in mind. And that is to destroy, to their heart's delight, and to find pleasure in that destruction. That is a really, 
um, that's really enlightening and really interesting, the biophilic and necrophilic distinction. Mm. And mm. Um, your point about objective measurement, that so the way that I was conceptualizing this was as a cycle of, of um, oppression and marginalization and privilege. Yeah. But what you're really mm. describing is a never ending march of continued destruction. And so you yes. can alter perceptions mm. in order to continue to come up with reasons to perpetually either identify even a formerly quote privileged group which now has been stripped of their privileges they can still be identified with their former privileges and targeted for further destruction until they're Absolutely. pretty much annihilated and then you just add more characters to that you just add whoever's adjacent to that and can continue to yes. march forward it's a different a different it, picture right and and, and, then, and then they will move to the next target to destroy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see um I think it was two or three years ago, I wrote uh, a, an article for Marian West, The Psychology of Critical Social Justice. And in that article, I made mention of um, the way critical social justice activists experience and use history. To them, history does not exist as something historical. Mm -hmm. So Van Volkan is a psychoanalyst and he uses this phrase, you say, oh, this expression, there is time collapse. So there's perceived insult. There is time collapse to something in the past. So something in the present resembles something in the past. It's almost as if they resurrect the historical conflict and they psychologically enact that conflict in the here and the now only with new role players in the game. So they could destroy what is, what is currently identified as the oppressor, and they could obliterate that oppressor. But remember, history would still exist for them, and that would still fuel them to, mm -hmm. to move on to the next identity to destroy. Mm -hmm. Because there is no critical self-reflection here, there is no way for them to say, hang on, guys, I think we're messing up big time. Mm -hmm. Within the mindset of primitive envy, the self is idealized. Okay. So by yeah. virtue of the self's experienced or perceived suffering, no behavior would be considered to be too immoral or too heinous that it couldn't be justified by that suffering. So whatever they do, it is justified. There is no built-in self-correction. Hmm. There is time collapse that takes place. They 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 thrive on historical insults, historical um, um, defeats, and that fuels their resentment and their determination to continue to destroy and destroy and to celebrate their hmm. destruction. Hmm. I think we certainly see that in these current so movements. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to tell me where I am maybe exaggerating to uh, a bit or a lot. I know I'm, I'm just sort of taking this in and I feel like you've offered a lot of really helpful new concepts that I'm hearing for the first time. So this is really fascinating. I hope if you have links to some of the articles that you've referenced or the papers that you've referenced, Please. I would love to include them yeah. in the notes here so that people can follow Absolutely. those and read more if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And and Absolutely. so in terms of the 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 resentment discourse, as you mm. as you call it, and I, I think that's a really brilliant way to talk about it. What is that doing to our kids? Because this is another place we're just seeing this. This is I feel like the the primary place people are encountering this is through the education system right now. And that goes from little children all the way up to, you know, graduate students, but we're seeing this come through, um, through in our children's curricula. And that is really concerning. So what, what are your thoughts on what we are experiencing in our youth education? Mm -hmm. So I recently attended a conference in Killarney here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. 
and one of the items on the on the agenda was a talk on books that appear on bookshelves but also in, in libraries focusing on um, trans and children when you read some of the things that those authors include in those books, you can see that they're already starting, or they're, they're, they've already infused this, this discourse with resentment. Mm -hmm. They would say things like, um, um, things like, my parents didn't, didn't love me in this body, but my new family will love me in my new body. Mm -hmm. Things like those. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I recently saw... Uh, a cartoon where it's again ma meant for kids <clears throat> where there are two dinosaurs two eggs and the one kid says look those are two dinosaurs but they are two daddies and look they cannot have kids but they really want to have kids that is so unfair see that mm -hmm. resentment mm -hmm. that is so unfair mm -hmm. so they frame it as as, as something compassionate, um, they 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 want they they want to to militarize children on the basis of compassion to intervene into these victims who find themselves suffering because of an unfair system where certain people couldn't have babies, and other people couldn't be um, accepted for who they are because they were born in the wrong body. Um, and then along with it, Leslie, we see the infiltration of age-inappropriate material. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the U.S., we have seen, um, you know, some, re some, some recent examples of parents standing up against this tendency of books ending up in libraries that are most certainly considered, should be considered pornographic, mm -hmm. discussing things that we couldn't even say right here without your clicking made for adults or not appropriate for children mm -hmm. when you broadcast this on YouTube. And um, my question is, how how did they get that far? Think about Drag Queen Story Hour, mm -hmm. where there are mothers taking their young toddlers, kids, to Drag Queen Story Hour. It's mm -hmm. not the same mistake as in the old days, taking your kids to go watch the pantomime, mm -hmm. where funny old men dress as women and they behave silly and mm -hmm. everybody knows that they're just men trying to be women and they're sucking at it in any way. It was just great fun. This isn't the same. Something similar, but again, within a different discourse. Mm -hmm. It's where an activist discourse. It it's an activist discourse building upon resentment and also building upon this notion that something is withheld from you. Mm. Society is withholding something from you that you are entitled to. Mm -hmm. Bami Vulcan uses, uses the expression entitlement ideology. Mm -hmm. And because you're entitled to it, and because by virtue of their withholding it from you, that justifies your aggressive retaliation to reclaim what is rightfully yours. And these are children. Um, one would think that parents would hold the line. Parents would hold the structure. I am all for age appropriate, gradual introduction to things that are sensitive and risky, such as sexu sexual behavior, by all means. But it has to be within a specific discourse. And it is a discourse of seriousness, of, of caution, um, because of various health and, and societal risks that they could get themselves embroiled in if they are not, caught, not cautious. Mm -hmm. With, with drag queens, Queen Story Hour, some of those drag queens have the most dis disgusting names. Mm -hmm. They twerk, they dish out sex toys, send mm -hmm. them around. You know, I saw one clip where the drag queen invited a, a girl, a country girl, a girl or a boy, to, to come to them. And I remember the boy or, or the child looking at mommy, looking at the drag queen, 
looking at mommy and mommy says, go on, go on. Instinctively, she knew this isn't kosher. Mm -hmm. This isn't kosher. Mm -hmm. And yet parents are pushing their children into this. This mm -hmm. is nonsense. This is, this is harmful. We know children engage reality and reality can be challenging and gradually they integrate their understanding of reality. And it is nothing else but some but but something akin to um, cultic abuse when you disrupt the fabric of reality in the case of children. So that that example of the parent who there's the child who's being invited into something that feels yeah. unsafe to the child. Yeah. The child isn't sure about it, wants yeah. to check with mom to make sure this is okay, is, yeah. is dealing with a lot of uncertainty, checks with mom and mom says it's okay, even though the child's instincts are all firing, saying this doesn't feel yes. right. So would you classify that as cultic abuse? I'm wondering what that is. Ritual it's, abuse. Uh, it, ritual it, it, abuse? It, it, okay. It's ritual abuse. Okay. Because they're, 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 they're um, what is the word? It's almost like a they're sacrifice. Inducting. Okay. It, it's an induction. Okay. They're inducting their children. Is that the word? They're inducting Maybe. their children mm -hmm. into this way of thinking. They're disrupting mm -hmm. the, the, the child's understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Think about this. So in, psycho in, in, in psychology, we have this concept called um, folie à deux. Folie à deux means shared psychosis. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. the, way, the, the, the way it is taught is usually that um, we tend to see it only when a parent or a caregiver is psychotic or has schizophrenia or may have over, overvalued ideas and delusional. And then we, 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 we tend to encounter similar beliefs in the children mm -hmm. it is not necessarily because the children are, um, are hallucinating or are, are schizophrenic themselves it is because they share in the subjectivity of the parent mm -hmm. but this also happens when parents are severely depressed severely depressed uh, parents tend to have severely depressed children and also to parents that are emotionally dysregulated and e easily agitated children tend to to copy that too Mm -hmm. So if you think about this, where parents and caregivers and teachers disrupt the fabric of reality, children participating in that will also be disrupted, severely disrupted. And that is what ritual abuse does. They also disrupt the fabric of reality involving children. Or an ideology. For a certain for 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 a certain religious political religious ideology, mm -hmm. and it is it's got nothing to do with tolerance. Some of the parents might say, and I've encountered some say, yes, you see, we're teaching our children tolerance. Mm -hmm. You don't get your children to be an animal lover by teaching them to pat a dangerous animal. Mm -hmm. There are there are different ways of teaching your children to be an animal lover. There are different ways of teaching your ch your, your child to be tolerant of people. Mm -hmm. who may be transgender, who may be gay, who may be lesbian, without exposing them to dangerous, over-sexualizing situations. Mm -hmm. It is as simple as that. It's a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer until five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard but it that described... Is the I, I, I've also heard it described in terms of, of a sacrificial offering on mm. behalf of the parent, um, showing I'm willing to give my child to this dangerous situation to demonstrate how fervent a believer I am in this um, in this ideology. Jamie Reed, um, she is a she calls herself a queer woman. She's married to a trans man. She's a whistleblower of a gender clinic in St. Louis. And when she was asked, why is this such a trend among very rich middle class people? And her idea was, you know, within this victimhood Olympics, where it, appearances are everything, there is an incentive for, for parents, for white middle class parents, 
to sacrifice their children, not her words, my word, to sacrifice their children to gain victimhood points. Mm, mm. And that is what some of, some of these parents are prepared to do. Mm -hmm. And that is how long this is. Mm -hmm. That makes sense because it, it um, allows you an avenue in to a, a more acceptable identity if you Absolutely. are if you're playing the victim game and this is compassionate see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compassionate mm -hmm. anything anything that's frustrating is harmful within a victim culture mm -hmm. if it's uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable to 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 someone of a victim identity marker that's harmful to them Mm -hmm. If it's uncomfortable to someone of an oppressor identity, uh, identity marker, that is just discomfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to these victims, what is, what is what is what is uncomfortable is also very harmful. It's not only discomfort, but it's it's labeled as fragility. Yes. It's a, fragility. and it's a character flaw on the part of the. Yeah. And it goes, it, it, you know, it's 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 another way to demonize that class. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I feel like this conversation has given me so much perspective and so much to think about, and I'm really grateful for this. I, I feel like I could um, easily talk to you for another hour, but maybe this is a good place to wind down. Is there anything that you feel like um, you want, we, we didn't address that we should bring up any final thoughts or um, a summary that you'd like to direct people to and to do more reading or or more listening on this someone else formulated this this trend in the oedipal drama what we understand in in psychoanalysis to be the oedipus complex or the oedipus oedipal drama it is an author named howard schwartz and he wrote of the psychology of political correctness mm. And it is a very interesting summary that, that 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 he made in some of his books, and obviously with a lot of examples, where there is this collusion between the mother and the child, and a hostile, it's a collusion in hostility against a father that is deemed oppressive. Um, and that is a lovely metaphor, not lovely, but I mean, that is a very apt metaphor to describe the dynamics of today, hmm. where comfort is everything, where there is this wish to resume an innocent, pristine self, where I can do anything, I can I can engage in anything to my heart's delight, and anything that limits my full, unbridled expression of desire, obtaining of pleasure, is deemed oppressive. And that act, that quite aptly summarizes what we see around us today. How it shreds. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I think that's really interesting. And um, I'm really grateful for the way that you've framed this. It's, um, it's, there's so much about this that I think has been destabilizing and confusing mm -hmm. for me as an adult, let alone for the children that are, that are hearing this. So it's, it's really helpful to hear a clear and, and sober analysis of the things that are going on underneath. I hope it was what clear. we're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> it was very helpful. So okay. thank you again for lovely. joining me today. I really Absolutely. enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for your time. And I hope we can have another one. I hope so too. Enough. Yeah, I'd like that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>